H. Jackson Center, and we're just so thrilled that the folks from Rotary could join the public at large for the first ever Al and Marge Brown uh, funded lecture, of which we have the foremost World War II historian, bar none. And I want to thank Phil and Mary Ann Zimmer for initially funding this through the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation. Let's give them a hand for it. <coughs> <coughs> In addition, we're honored to have in our presence fam members of the Brown family, Shauna and Dan Anderson, Brewster and Betsy Brown, and Sherry Galecki. They're all here. Thank you. Give them a hand. We have an awful lot of special guests, and I will not go out of uh, have time to recognize everyone, but we're glad to see various students from SUNY at Fredonia to join us. Uh, at this particular event. And again, especially thanks to Rotary for making this part of their programming, to uh, Katie uh, Geis and to Becky Robbins for, again, supporting this wonderful first time ever Brown Fund Lecture. What you're about to hear is an interview. An interview with Gerhard Weinberg, Dr. Gerhard Weinberg, whose internationally recognized authority on Nazi Germany and the origins and course of World War II. He's the Professor Emeritus of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's the author or editor of numerous books and, and articles on the 20th century European and world history. Foremost is his book on, entitled A World at Arms, A Global History of World War II. The best testament happened last night. We had a dinner here, and we know one of uh, uh, our foremost local historians, Raleigh Kidder, saluted you. Saluted to Gerhard Weinberg, the guy who wrote the Bible on World War II. This coming from Raleigh uh, told me everything. And he brought his book, the book of Dr. Weinberg, uh, which is incredible. In addition to this, and we'll get into some detail, he's written books on the visions of victory, the hopes of eight World War II leaders. He actually found, edited, and uh, did the introduction on Hitler's second book. Everybody knows about Mein Kampf, but we probably don't know about the second book. We'll get into that today, among other things. He's the 2009 Pritzker Military Museum and Library Literature Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing, and currently sits on the museum's Presidential Counselor's Advisory Board, and his resume goes on and on and on. Now, personally, Dr. Weiber, we didn't talk about this, but my wife, Cindy, who uh, will be here <laughs> shortly, last night insisted that she had you. She had you in class, that she knew all about you, and I said, wait a minute, I'm doing sort of a biographical search on you, Dr. Weinberg, and my wife, trying to see where they would have matched. My wife went to Allegheny College, Dickinson School of Law, University of Buffalo School of Law. You were in Chicago, Michigan, University of North Carolina, and none of that seemed to match, and I thought this was delusional activity by my wife. <laughs> don't, she's not here yet, so don't, don't repeat this. <laughs> However, it dawned on me this morning, you know, we all have those shower moments. You know, the only moment of clarity, at least to me, is about six o'clock when all of a sudden things clear up. And so here's what happened, Dr. Weinberg. In 2001, when the Jackson Center became a reality, I thought it'd be great to have something for this theater to watch. A little six minute introductory movie. So I went out and violated every copyright there was and grabbed uh, images of Robert Jackson at Nuremberg and images from other very important people to tell the story. Time will not permit us to show 
that little introductory movie, which we do show still after 17 years. But the very first voice, the very first words of anybody on that 2001 introductory video is one Dr. Gerhard Weinberg. So my wife has seen it so much, so often, she feels like she knows you intimately. And I can't wait to actually tell her, I wish you were here to hear it, uh, about the fact that that video, which is our introductory video from 2001, you tell the story about World War II. So uh, I'm so thrilled that not only I remembered that this morning in a moment of clarity, but here we are today with Dr. Weinberg and an opportunity uh, that we've been trying to make real for the last many years, and here we are today. So we're going to have an introduction with Dr. Weinberg. Dr. Weinberg. We, we were, uh, yesterday we were having a chance to uh, walk around the Jackson Center and you wanted to be sure that I asked you about the fact of Nuremberg. As you see around this theater here are various images of Robert Jackson being at the Nuremberg trial. Uh, before I forget to ask, what, what's your connection with Nuremberg? First, can you hear me? Yes. When I was in graduate school at the University of Chicago, I was informed that the law library of the university had been sent years before a huge number of crates of documents and materials from Nuremberg. It became my job to open the crates and organize the material. This was an extraordinary experience because included were not just transcripts of the main trial at Nuremberg and several of the subsequent proceedings, but there were large numbers of photos copies of German documents. So here I am holding photocopies of volumes of the German Navy war diary of World War II well. and all kinds of other materials and use them, those that were relevant, for both, both my MA thesis and my PhD dissertation, uh, which uh, engaged uh, German-Soviet relations 1939 to 41. And this familiarity with German military, naval, and other documents was critical to my getting my first job at a time when practically none of my fellow graduate students were able to get into the academic world because those were the years, the early 50s, when the GIs were graduating and for the first and only time in American history, college and university enrollments were dropping. And colleges and universities, for obvious reasons, were not hiring. So it was ironically uh, getting involved with the Nuremberg documents that was important, but the other side of this was that I set up the program for organizing these and did much of it myself. And that is now the collection of Nuremberg materials at the Center for Research Libraries. And the one thing they need to do is microfilm it all because the paper is deteriorating. And if they don't do that, they'll have a nice center, but no Nuremberg materials. You were born in 1930. 28. Like I said, 1928. <laughs> so much for my math. He's 90 years old. Unbelievable. He's been uh, 90 going on 70. Uh, most re remarkable 
uh, uh, individual. So 1928 born uh, where? Hanover, Germany. And where, just geographically, about where was that? Hanover is in north central Germany, was once the capital of this state uh, when the uh, Hanoverian rulers uh, ruled the British Empire alongside their kingdom in northwest Germany. But if you ever look at a map of Germany as it is today, you'll probably find Berlin and then you go west to the Rhineland and halfway is Hanover. Or if you start at the north with the big port of Hamburg and you go straight south, uh, you will very quickly come to Hanover that way. In Hanover during this time period, 1928, uh, what, did your, what did your dad do for a living? My father had acquired a doctorate in law at the University of Münster in northwest Germany, was then a judge for a while, and was in the German army in the First World War. Though wounded and decorated, he went back into the judiciary and found the atmosphere there impossible to put up with, so he moved into the new Ministry of Finance and was assigned to the finance office in Hanover for that by then Prussian province. That's why we lived in Hanover. In between, he had been in Upper Silesia, was the last German official to turn Tarnowitz over to the Poles. At any rate, he was assigned there. In uh, 1933, when the Nazis came to power, uh, any Jewish person in, the, in a government position was tossed out, except that at the insistence of the then President Field Marshal Hindenburg, those who had served in the German army at the front in the First World War were not fired, and that included my father. In August of 1934, Hindenburg died, whereupon all those who had been exempt were tossed out. So in 1934, in August, uh, my father was uh, chased out of his position and uh, we stayed in the same apartment, in the same building. It's just that the living room became my father's office. Uh, having been trained legally, having worked in government, he could read and understand German legalese, which I can assure you is a separate language. And so that meant that he could advise people who were planning to leave Germany as to the rules as to what they could take, what they couldn't take, what papers they had to have on all the rest of it. And so, as I said, the, the living room uh, became his office and the entrance hall, the waiting room for people going to see him. And he would continue to do that uh, until uh, he left, my, his, my mother, his wife, left in the spring of 1939. Part of what he was doing there in that office was in fact uh, uh, helping people f to try to immigrate from, uh, from Germany. How did that work? What was the process there? The process was very complicated and difficult. Not so, leaving Germany involved apply, applying, going through miscellaneous rules, leaving behind much of your property and most of your money. The biggest problem at the time was not leaving Germany, but getting some other country to let you in. Please keep in mind, we're talking about the latter years of the Great Depression. And most countries had taken steps to restrict immigration. The uh, 
great accomplishment, as I'm sure you know, uh, of the Harding, uh, Coolidge, and Hoover administration was to bring on the Great Depression. Uh, I do not want to deprive them of credit for this, but what is often forgotten is that the one major measure that President Hoover took to cope with the Depression was to instruct the Department of State to instruct its consular officials around the world so to administer the already very restricted immigration legislation of 1924 as to hopefully keep as many immigrants out of the United States as possible and not have the 100,000 a year that were allowed under the legislation. So that in fact, the American quota was not filled in 1933, 34, 35 and it was only after he was re-elected as president in 1936 that President Roosevelt had those instructions canceled and the quota was filled, German quota was filled in 37, 38, 39, and even in 1940. And other countries, for the most part, also tried to keep people out at a time when jobs were scarce, economic situation was difficult. You are in Germany. Uh, Hitler uh, takes power, 1933 time period. What was it like where you were growing up at age five? Uh, did you see the, the, the Nazis? The, uh, did, did that affect your, obviously affected your dad's career, but did it affect you on a day-to-day -day basis? School, in other words, you're Jewish, and being at that time period, how did that impact you? Well, it, well obviously, the 1935 uh, firing of my father and the change in the apartment was an immediate effect. That was also very soon thereafter, I'm starting school. And in school, things could be very unpleasant. Uh, other kids would taunt me and sometimes beat me. And eventually I developed a habit that uh, as so often my nose was bleeding, uh, I would find a place uh, between school and home where between houses or whatnot I could hide until my nose stopped bleeding because otherwise I knew I would upset my mother uh, when I came home. Uh, another way in which as a kid these things affected me is that I could not, I wanted to learn to swim, but couldn't because all swimming places were closed to Jews. Uh, when one walked in the downtown area of Hanover where there were restaurants, most of them would have signs, big signs, uh, either at the door or in one of the windows that they would not serve Jewish persons. Uh, my, I have a brother, I'm the baby in our family. There's a sister who's four years older than I and a brother in between us. And my brother, uh, his experience in the school system was so bad that my parents withdrew him from the school, sent him to live with a family in Berlin and attend the Jewish school there. Uh, so uh, we shared a room in the apartment, but most of the time he wasn't there. And since he had a pet goldfish, one of my responsibilities was to feed the goldfish. <laughs> well, one of those things. Uh, the other thing that very much had an impact was that not only was swimming pools closed, but uh, uh, concerts and other such things. And only, not only in Hanover, but in other cities elsewhere, as I learned, one could buy a ticket to the zoo. And Hanover has a big, famous zoo. My parents would buy me an annual permit and I would go there 
uh, quite frequently. In the mid-30s, either in 35 or 36, my parents bought a car, and because of dad's World War I wound, he could not drive, so mother did the driving, which in those days for the woman to drive the family around was kind of unusual, but she did. But then came the new rule, I believe either late in 36 or early 37, that Jews could not drive. So the family got rid of the car uh, that we had had for a while. The other thing that we always heard about was that the family would take vacations as a group. And my mother would always have to call the hotels in whatever place we were going to whether or not they would accept Jewish clients. And that was a sort of annual routine, routine for summer vacations. Uh, there were, in other words, a series of increasing restrictions, and my parents decided there was no future for the three of us. Uh, we would have to go as help by family already in the United States and had to start learning English. And there was an elderly English lady in Hanover living with her sister in an apartment where we began to have English lessons. But I have to admit that I was more intrigued by their pet parrot <laughs> than uh, by the uh, lessons in English. Though in my last stay in the school system, English started as a school language. So by the time I left Germany at the very end of 1938, not that I was fluent in English, but I'd had quite a bit and a good start in the language. Kristallnacht occurs during that 1938 time period. You had a synagogue in Hanover. Was it impacted? Yes, in fact, it was the aspect of the November 38 program that I personally was most disturbed by. My father was arrested, but his former boss got him released after a few days. His twin brother, uh, we knew, was not only arrested but sent to a concentration camp. No doubt that was his reward for fighting in the German army at the Battle of Verdun. Uh, those things and being kicked out of school uh, certainly hurt. But I knew that people were nasty to each other. Uh, not only had my father been wounded in the war, but I knew, everybody knew, that millions had been killed and wounded in the war. There's a war going on, a civil war in Spain. There is a war going on between China and Japan. That people are nasty to each other, nobody needed to explain to me. But in German, a house of worship, what we call a house of worship, is called a Gottes house, the house of God. That people should be so mad at God that they would set fire to God's house struck me at the time as, uh, as I said, 10 year old, just short of 11th birthday, as something quite different in a different category of horror. There is bad weather, there are people who are nasty to each other, these are all unpleasant parts of life, if you will. But the idea that people would set fire to God's house seemed to me as a kid in a completely separate and different category of horror. The synagogue that we attended uh, and went to for the high holy days and so on and so forth, that that should be, that, that troubled me in a different way and also raised in my mind at the time the thinking, well now, 
What if God gets bad at them? What's going to happen to these people, uh, including those who didn't want to burn the synagogue? Uh, that was, I'm describing my reaction at the time. Uh, needless to say, I was pleased when my uncle, dad's twin brother, was released and could go to England also. That was then the rule in the concentration camps, as we now know. Some 30,000 Jews were sent to concentration camps in November 38. But if they left the country, they could at that point get out. And that was how uh, my, uh, that uncle got out. Another uncle had what I thought, and came to think later even more, I'll explain in a minute, an even better way of avoiding being arrested. He bought himself a heavy coat in case he got into a concentration camp, but then took a train trip, got on a train. And for about four or five days, rode by train all around Germany. He was, in other words, never home when the police came to p collect him. And by the time, <clears throat> excuse me, after five or six days he got home, they weren't arresting anymore. Mm. And I was very pleased in this country in the early 40s to inherit what was called the concentration camp coat because as I do not have to explain to this audience, in Albany, New York, a good winter coat is very important. Uh. So you and your siblings got out of Germany, uh, part of that kinder transport. No, we did not. Did the not? kinder transport was for kids who were arranged to go to England separate from families assumed to be eventually returning to Germany. Yeah. We, both the three of us kids, and a few months later, my parents came, got out of Germany to England while waiting for our quota numbers to the United States. So this was a different category, and the same thing would be true of my father's twin brother, the uncle I mentioned, his wife, and uh, several of his kids. So you go to England with a, with a hope for meeting the quota, and then you find yourself coming to the United States. Did you require a sponsor to be able to come to the United States? Yes. So I, there had to be someone who not only promised to support you for the rest of your life if necessary, but who could demonstrate that he had the funds to do it. That was a, one of these coincidental pieces of very good fortune that an uncle of my mother's, who was born and grew up in Germany, came to the United States around the turn of the century. He was a genius in metallurgical engineering made a fortune on his patents, became one of the founding leaders of the Inland Steel Corporation, made a fortune in this country, and proceeded to use a part of the, function, of the fortune, which he saved during the Depression, to bring relatives, some of them very distant relatives, into the United States and to bring other people as well, something that we discovered when in London in August of 1940. Uh, my father had been interned as an enemy alien, and when the quota numbers came up after my mother and the three of us had been processed, the Brits brought a whole bunch of men from their internment camp on the Isle of Man to London to be processed. And we went to Grosvenor Square in front of the American Embassy in the hope that we could see Dad through a window and maybe wave to him.
But while we were there, we met another lady and with her daughter who were there for the same reason. The husband and father was in the same group. It turned out that my great uncle was bringing these three people. He and the man had done their military duty in Prussia together back in the 1880s. They had remained in touch and he was now bringing the three of them to the United States. So when we got to Glasgow by train and the men were released and the families reunited, there were eight of us <laughs> that he was bringing on the same boat at the same time. As you're in the United States and you're looking at the newspaper on a daily basis, what was your reaction to seeing the uh, aggressiveness, the aggression of your fatherland and through its leader Hitler as it was running rampant through Europe and ultimately Russia? What was your sense of all that as a teenage boy? I followed that, uh, having experienced uh, first the part of the Battle of Britain and then part of the Blitz in England. And it seemed to me, at least at the time, as a part of a deliberate stage-by-stage -stage effort to conquer everything. And uh, one had seen in the Germany of the 30s, when I was still there, that rearmament was moving forward. And uh, when I first came to this country in September 1940, of course, the war in Europe was going on, uh, but the United States was still officially neutral. But the other side of neutrality was that the United States news services and newspapers had correspondence all over the place. Uh, because as I said, we weren't in the war yet, this country. So I tried to follow that and thought it exceedingly dangerous and uh, assumed that sooner or later they would attack the United States. And that as my brother got older and I got older, we would be in the service and the older of our cousins in this country were uh, drafted for obvious reasons ahead of us. It's purely an age matter. So uh, that was a part of a situation that sooner or later uh, I assumed I'd be in it, but uh, uh, I was one of the lucky ones uh, in that by the time I was 18 and drafted, 1946, higher mathematics will show you that, uh, <laughs> the war was over. But uh, my brother was even luckier in a way because he was in one of the units, a year and a half older than I, he was in one of the units scheduled for Operation Olympic. That is to say, the invasion of Kyushu, the southern of the Japanese home islands. And there was, as he told me afterwards, very considerable cheering uh, among his fellow soldiers in August of 1945, when after the atomic bombs were dropped, uh, the war with Japan ended, and they ended going as occupation troops uh, instead of uh, invading Kyushu. You uh, do have a stint in the army in 1946 and 47. Uh, yes. Uh, then after that, academically, you find your way to the University of Chicago. Yes. And then I'm going to fast forward a little bit because you then get a job which was unique, a job in uh, uh, a, a for the government uh, in a big building near the Potomac River, which housed a, a lot of confiscated German documents. Could you explain what your job was there? When I finished in 1951 and got, finished my PhD, 
I was very fortunate to get a job. The United States Air Force and Human Resource Institute uh, in Maxwell Air Force Base had a contract with Columbia University to have people look at the captured German records which the American Army kept in a section of its archive, World War II archives, in the old torpedo factory on the shore of the Potomac in Alexandria. So for three years, I worked in these records, uh, first uh, checking also on records that were taken from Germany, brought to this country, but not to Alexandria, to the Library of Congress and to various institutions around the country. And my first book, it's the Guide to Capture German Documents, grew out of this, and then worked on the project that the Air Force uh, had provided the money for, which was to study the resistance of Soviet partisans to the German occupation. And so we broke that up into specific geographic areas and technical topics, and more by luck than by design, I got two of the most important and useful of these. One of them was in the regional, as we divided the German occupation, occupied part of the Soviet Union into separate areas. And I ended up with the one which was the only part of the partisan, German anti-partisan warfare where they really fought partisans and crushed them. And that was the Yelnya Dorogobush area of Smolensk. Uh, and this is an area, I would say, about 150, 180 miles uh, to the west of Moscow. So I studied that area, and uh, the result has been published. The other technical subject I was to do was the role of air power in partisan and anti-partisan warfare. And you will understand that the Air Force sponsors of the project were very interested in, in that particular one and were happy to get uh, my findings and results. And they've been published and, interestingly enough, republished privately uh, uh, since. So for three years, I worked in this uh, war documentation project, and that had undoubtedly something to do with the fact that after a year's teaching, when the issue of returning the documents to the Germans came up, and a program for microfilming them was established, I was put in charge of organizing and running the microfilm project, at least for a while, then turned it over to the professional I had been authorized to hire and then go back in summers between teaching regular semesters uh, in subsequent years. One day in the summer of 1958, Gerhard Weinberg was in his office looking through a batch of files. He opened up a thick folder that was labeled as partial draft of Mein Kampf. And you were quoted as saying, it was mislabeled, as I discovered in the opening lines. What did you find? What I found was something that I knew, had discovered in my researches existed, but I had not yet turned up. And that was another book that Hitler dictated in 1928. And it turned out that a typed draft of this had been kept in the Nazi party publishing house in a safe. Hitler had never authorized publishing it. He would referred to it in a conversation, but he never authorized publication. And in May of 1945, when the United States occupied the army, occupied that area, 
Munich was in the American zone of occupation in post-war Germany. They had confiscated this. Two things then happened. One was that the American army microfilmed it and gave a microfilm to the British. The original typescript was shipped with other captured German documents and ended up mislabeled as a partial draft of Mein Kampf in the record center in Alexandria. And in the summer of 58, when between teaching, you see, as I just mentioned, uh, I was on the, working on the microfilm project, I got the, in the routine to this. I had, in the meantime, started working as my main research project following the dissertation and revision of it for publication. I had thought it was about time for somebody to study the origins of World War II. As you may know, every second week there is another book on the origins and outbreak of World War I. But I thought I would let people who wanted to do that do it, but there wasn't a single book that comprehensively studied the origins of World War II and very quickly learned, as in my research, in the memoirs of a French intelligence officer who had interviewed one of Hitler's secretaries, in which Hitler's other book was mentioned, that he had dictated another book. And there was, in the then publicly available record of some of Hitler's uh, after dinner conversations, a reference by Hitler to a book. So I knew there was another one, and as soon as I started looking at this, <laughs> I realized this is not a draft of Mein Kampf, because in the opening paragraph, he refers to the second part of Mein Kampf. And it turned out to be the surviving text of the second book. Around that time, I received a letter from a man who had been the director of my doctoral dissertation at Chicago and was a key figure who was originally from Germany uh, and who was a key figure in establishing the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich. They had learned from a man who was a personal friend of the head in the Nazi party publishing house who had to keep all the things in the safe. And when this man, during World War II, had come home on leave to Munich and had visited his buddy, his buddy had shown him the manuscript. That's how the Institute learned that there was such a thing. And they, they wrote to me. They knew I was working on the filming, and the, they knew that I was a student of Rothfels uh, about this, and could I find it? And I wrote back and said, I just found it. <laughs> uh, and so they published it in German. It is, of course, in German. In 1962, uh, it took a few years to clear up things. But uh, <clears throat> there was then a pirated English edition, lousy translation, and all kinds of problems. And for 20 years, I could not get an American publisher to, to do this. But eventually I did, and there is now a reliable English language edition of uh, Hitler's second book. So, just get the flavor of what just happened. Mein Kampf was uh, uh, dictated in 1923. 
by uh, Adolf Hitler. It had some uh, hard times being sold. It wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. until it really, uh, he hit full stride that, did that become popular. He apparently dictated a second book after he lost his election, right? Didn't, so nice yes, one, it's, very, it's very clear that he did this in the summer of 1928, when in the 1926 elections, the Nazi party had done not nearly as well as he anticipated. And as he tried to see, well, what went wrong? Why didn't we do better? The answer that he came up with is probably at least in part correct. What one has to remember is that at the end of the First World War, a war in which Italy, please remember, was on the Allied side, a piece of Austria, the southern part of the province of Tyrol, was turned over to Italy. And this particular territory included some people who were of Italian background, but a very substantial proportion, I don't want to get into the argument of percentages, a very substantial proportion were of German background. And they were probably the minority in the Europe of the 1920s who were most severely being attacked or at least pushed into learning Italian, into no longer singing songs in German, changing church services, etc., etc. And there was in Germany, uh, needless to say, a lot of noise in the newspapers about this minority that was being oppressed. In his book, Mein Kampf, and in his speeches, Hitler, who was a great admirer of Mussolini, who had taken over in Italy in 1922, called for an alliance with Italy. And the other political parties utilized against the Nazis, the National Socialist Party, this advocating of an alliance with Italy which was repressing the German minority. And Hitler was of the opinion that this campaign against his party on the issue of an alliance with Italy was a key factor in their doing so badly in the election. And unlike some politicians who might then sort of soft pedal the issue that had caused vote, uh, cost votes, Hitler insisted and made clear in his new dictated book just the opposite. That is to say, the alliance should be with Italy, and why, and how, and so on and so forth. He then never, as I said, published it. I had to do it for him, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting from that perspective uh, that this was, on the one hand, the issue on which he probably, at least in part, correctly believed the party, his party had lost votes, but he was not going to soft pedal that issue. He was quite clear in his own mind that that was the right thing for Germany to do because Italy's expansion would have to be at the expense of the newly independent countries of Southeast Europe and the colonial possessions of France and of England. So uh, Germany and Italy were obvious allies. And uh, this is something he uh, dictated uh, in the summer of 1928. In the second book also, there's reference to probably the answer to the question that most 
scholars have dealt with is, did Hitler plan on an eventual invasion of the United States? Do you, do you want to speak to that? I, the, 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 this, I will in just a second, but there is something about this which is so widely ignored that I think I better mention it first. Don't you love these professors? Yeah, I love them. In the first, before and during the First World War, there was a big debate in German naval headquarters whether the invasion of the United States by Germany should start on the beaches of Cape Cod in Massachusetts or the beaches of Long Island in New York. This sense of Germany invading the United States you will not find mentioned anywhere in other people's literature. It is subject that has just simply been totally ignored. But the notion, let me put it this way, of Germany at some point invading the United States and taking it over was not something that Adolf dreamt up. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Now, let me turn to his view. It had, was his view from the beginning, and he never made any bones about it, that Germany needed to take over the world. The only way I believe that one can understand this or try to visualize this is the way you and I generally eat an artichoke. You take the leaf from the outside, dip it into something, and work your way slowly to the middle. Try to think of a reversal of this. Europe, all Europeans agreed in the 19th, 20th century, is the center of the universe. And Germany is at the center of Europe. So if you're going to take the globe, you do it a leaf at a time, starting in the middle, till you get to the outside. And that, by definition, includes the United States, which will not give up its independence when its main national holiday is Independence Day just because Adolf is so handsome. <laughs> and there was furthermore, in Hitler's view, an aspect of this need for war with the United States, which was his reading of the immigration laws that I've already alluded to, which had been passed in the early 1920s, and which were very clearly designed to exclude Eastern Orthodox Catholics from such places as Russia, Roman Catholics from such places as Italy and Southeast Europe, and Jews from Eastern Europe. But to favor the very people that Hitler thought were the racially superior Nordic people. Therefore, while conquering Eastern Europe with its racially inferior, in his view, Slavic people, would be quite easy. We'd better do, take on the US the sooner the better, because they've got this racial immigration policy that may make them stronger over time and more difficult as enemies. And therefore, when he was reviewing German policy in 1928, he explained that one of the major responsibilities of a national socialist government of Germany would be to prepare for war with the United States. And when he became chancellor, 
1933, he was looked at the sequence. Yes, we have to first fight and crush Czechoslovakia to strengthen our position in Central Europe and have a few more divisions to recruit, but most of the land is to the east. But we cannot send our army to the Urals with the French and British next to our major industrial area. So war number two is Britain and France, and that's where the ma we had the trouble last time, so that's where the major preparations have to be. War number three is the Soviet Union, and there, by the great good fortune of the Bolshevik Revolution, total incompetence, of, incompetence have replaced the partially Germanic bureaucracy to rule S Slavic inferior, so no new weapons are needed for that. But it is not, I would suggest, a coincidence that just as soon as the weapons for the war with England and France are underway in 37, Hitler orders prepare an intercontinental bomber and a super battleship. The practical needs for war with the United States. This is as the U.S. is passing neutrality laws. Uh, since these are technological innovations, they will take a long time to perfect, and therefore they get started early in 1937. Uh, they don't come off in the way he expected. I don't want to go into that now unless you want me to, but it's, a, I think, worth noting that what, from his point of view, was the earliest possible time, 1937, the designs for the, what's called the America Bomber. Why America Bomber? Obviously to fly, bomb, and return without refueling. And the super battleships, those start in 37. In 1962, you actually go back to Hanover, uh, having left there in 1938-39 time period. What was your reflections going back to your fatherland and your hometown? Well, I was going back to do research on this book on the origins of World War II, and so I was going to work uh, in the... Uh, German Foreign Office Ministry archives, which were at that point uh, in Koblenz. And then I toured in a couple of other places, but it was to get a sense of what was happening there. And uh, uh, there was an aspect of what I saw that I found both ironic and intriguing. As I'm sure you know, uh, Germany was bombed a good deal in World War II, and there was also fighting in Germany in World War II. So there were lots of buildings destroyed. And in the immediate post-war reconstruction of the late 40s, early 50s, the rapid building, uh, re or rebuilding, whatever you want to call it, was, I would say politely, trash modern. And then a number of German city councils in the 60s going on decided that it would be much nicer to rebuild the old parts of town the way they once looked. And the expert on this, ironically, whom they hired several German cities made this decision, were Poles. And the reason they did that was that after World War II, in which the Germans, after the 1944 uprising in Warsaw, literally leveled Warsaw, 
the Poles decided both before the communists took it over completely and the communists took it, stuck to it, that they would rebuild the old parts of Warsaw the way they once looked. And as I can tell you from years later when I was in Warsaw, in the old parts of town, you think you're in the 16th or 17th or 18th century. So, ironically, the Germans who were the experts at leveling cities proceeded in several communities <laughs> to hire Polish experts who knew from their own experience as to how to uh, rebuild the old part of town the way it once looked. And uh, it's one of these ironies of history, <laughs> uh, but it made perfect sense. There is, if you want me to describe, the other side of this irony. As I'm sure you all know, there was a Berlin airlift when the Soviets blockaded West Berlin. When in 49, the airlift could be ended because the blockade ended, then President Truman decided on two steps to cope with the possibility that, who knows, the Soviets may do this again. West Berlin's not going to move. Step number one, which his successors also adhered to, was to start storing stuff underground in West Berlin. Powdered mill, coal, goodness knows what. The other was to issue instructions to the aircraft industry to develop an airplane, a four-engine transport plane that could carry more than the C-47s and 54s of the, of the airlift, but like those planes, very important, be able to land on a relatively short run and take off relatively short runway. His successors also followed in this. It is the origin of the C-130, mm. of which our Air Force still has a few. Nobody is allowed aboard as old as the plane. Now, came the end of the Cold War. And the question was, and some of you may remember this, what on earth, with the wall down and Germany reunified, do we do with this stuff that we bought decades ago and stored underground in Berlin? And then, something happened. The Soviet Union broke up. The transportation system was breaking. And in a number of the large cities, food was not being brought in and there were problems. We and the British decided that's what we do with the stuff from Berlin. <laughs> we would take it to the relieve famine and in the winter cold in these Russian cities. And since they all had small airports, the stuff was taken in C-130s. I've always thought that this is the opposite irony to the Germans hiring Poles to rebuild their old <laughs> part of town. We and the Brits agreed used the two measures to cope with the future Soviet blockade of Berlin, to bring relief to cities in the breaking up uh, Soviet Union. And what I would like to call to your attention is intriguing about this, is that when this happened, there was no serious debate or argument, either in this country or in England. People figured, uh, why not? This has made uh, reasonable sense. The other side of it is that the journalists at the time who reported on this 
not a one of them ever commented on the irony <laughs> that I just tried to call to your attention. I feel like we're going to get credit for some special, extraordinary uh, lecture from Professor Weinberg. And you've been referred to as, for Dr. Weinberg, the practice of history is a kind of defiance against forgetting, never forgetting. And your co entire career has been based upon making sure that you've documented uh, World War I, World War II, Hitler's second book, uh, a tremendous asset to communities like ours, history in general. You have been a, a, a tremendous beacon of light. And I, on behalf of everybody here, and on behalf of our first Al and Marge Brown Fund, want to thank you, Dr. Weinberg, for making this all a reality. Thank you so much. <laughs>if you want to come and say hello to Dr. Weinberg, he'll be here for a few minutes. And I want to thank Rotary for making this time and space available and to all the sponsors, including the Dwyer Fund. There are many folks here from uh, the veterans and through the veterans organizations who have supported this particular program as well. Thank you very much.